Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. 18-year-old Martha Ratliff just wanted to go home, but as she approached her house with her sister, she immediately knew that wasn't going to happen. The large colonial mansion at 1810 Cedar Street was swarming with unfamiliar people. Cops, crime technicians, neighbors, yellow crime scene tape crisscrossed over the front yard, barring Martha's entrance. She later told the Staircase's documentary team it was the worst thing in the world, and that's understandable. The one place where Martha was always welcome, no matter what, was suddenly completely off limits. Unable to get inside their home, Martha and her older sister Margaret spoke with their father, Michael Peterson. He told them that there had been an accident, a tragic accident. He was in shock, so the details were fuzzy. She had fallen down the stairs. There was nothing he could do, but the police were certain he was involved. Michael assured Martha and Margaret that he wasn't. Of course, Martha believed him, and Margaret too. This was Michael, their father, their caretaker. He wouldn't hurt anyone, let alone his beloved Kathleen Peterson. Welcome to episode 173, The Never-Ending Staircase, part one. Kathleen Morris Hunt was born on February 21st, 1953 to her mother Veronica and her father John in Greensboro, North Carolina. She had two sisters, Candace and Lori, and one brother, Stephen. They grew up primarily in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. At that time, she went by the name Kathy, and likewise, her sister Candace's pet name was Candy. Their childhood was, by all accounts, a normal, upper-middle-class, and happy upbringing. In her youth, Kathy had a wide range of interests, including swimming. At nine years old, she completed an intermediate swimming course at the YWCA and was awarded a Red Cross certificate. She was awarded yet another certificate for her swimming ability the very next year and competed on her local swim team. As a teenager, she really found her stride. By age 14, she was already involved in many activities. She was a student athlete, a musician, and a library aide. While attending high school, she became president of the debate club and editor of the school magazine. In the early 60s, Kathy was voted Girl of the Year and Lancaster Lass. She was also recognized by the city's Optimist Club for being an outstanding student. She volunteered at St. Joseph Hospital. She helped form a youth advisory council that contributed to local government decisions. She was the dictionary definition of a well-rounded young woman, compassionate, involved, and extremely smart. Kathy was so smart that the medium-sized city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, had to make changes to accommodate her intellect. She was the first high school student allowed to take advanced Latin classes at the nearby Franklin and Marshall College. That may not sound like such a big deal now, but in the 60s, not many teens were attending college classes, and definitely not girls. According to author Diane Fanning, there was a bit of rivalry, even jealousy, among Kathleen and her sisters, particularly with Candace, that would last into adulthood. Kathleen wasn't just gifted, she was preternaturally self-confident in a way that was way beyond her years and could be off-putting to her siblings. She was a natural leader, and she wasn't shy about it. Later, as a wife and mother, she insisted on hosting family events, not liking to swap years or share the honors, much to her sister Candace's irritation. Lori seemed to go along as the peacemaker. But in her teen years, that impressive self-confidence was well-earned. Kathleen was smart, but she also worked really hard. Her studies always came first. When she graduated high school, she was the number one student in her class of 473 students. She was even profiled in a publication called The Who's Who Book of American High School Students. 
And if you're wondering who buys a who's who book for high school students, well, the answer is pretty simple. The student's proud parents. And Kathleen's parents were incredibly proud, rightly so. After high school, Kathy continued to thrive. She attended North Carolina's esteemed Duke University, where she was the first female student accepted into the School of Engineering. That is an incredible achievement. From there, she received her Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Then, she received her Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering, also from Duke. You can only imagine the sexism she would have faced just to attend class. It's probably what made her such a tough lady in her adult years, and she was formidable. It was on a visit home from college that the serious young Kathy announced that she was going by her full name now, Kathleen. With Kathleen's glowing resume, it isn't surprising that her career was also extraordinarily successful. She worked up the ranks to executive-level positions at science and tech-focused companies like Baltimore Aircoil, Merck, and lastly, Northern Telecom, a telecommunications company better known as Nortel. Kathleen began working there in 1984 in an entry-level position. Fifteen years later, in 1999, she was promoted to Director of Communications. In her 17 years at Nortel, Kathleen received countless awards for her leadership ability and professional success. She traveled the world for her work, going to places like Russia, Ukraine, Vietnam, Malaysia, Europe, China, and Canada. She thrived in what was often a boys' club, earning their respect just as she earned her accolades and high salary. And there's no doubt about it, Kathleen made good money as Nortel's Director of Communications. In 2001, her yearly salary was $145,000. Today, that's the equivalent of almost a quarter of a million dollars. At this point, Kathleen lived in Durham, North Carolina, where a major U.S. branch of Nortel was located. In Durham, Kathleen remained a natural leader, an exemplary citizen in her community. She was the treasurer for the Durham Arts Council and frequently hosted events for the American Dance Festival as well as the Carolina Ballet. And on at least two occasions, Kathleen wrote to her local newspaper, The Herald Sun, to voice helpful opinions. One time, in 1989, she advocated that the local Durham Bulls baseball team keep the existing baseball stadium rather than pay $17 million for a new one. It wasn't a matter of suggesting a reallocation of funds or just tightening the city's budget. Actually, Kathleen was really concerned that ticket prices would increase and remove an affordable option for family fun. Kathleen cared about the children of Durham, all the children. Later, in 1991, she attended a dinner to help fund public education. During the meal, 37 students put on an outstanding performance, singing and dancing a wonderful cabaret. Kathleen thoroughly enjoyed the concert and wrote to the paper about how great the students did. She called their show impeccable. Besides being a great community member, Kathleen was really just a cool person to know. She threw a great party. She often invited her friends over for an evening. During these get-togethers, she would go above and beyond, decorating her house to the nines, cooking the extravagant meals herself, whether it was for 10 people or 50. Plus, Kathleen was an incredible mother. While attending Duke University, she met her first husband, physicist Fred Atwater. They married in 1977. On April 27, 1982, they had a daughter named Caitlin. But when Fred was unfaithful, he and Kathleen divorced. She was devastated by the divorce, but she persevered. She had to for her daughter Caitlin. So in 1986, Kathleen and four-year-old Caitlin were living in Durham, North Carolina. Around this time, Caitlin became friends with two little girls who lived down the street. Those girls were four-year-old Margaret Ratliff and her little sister, three-year-old Martha. Caitlin, Margaret, and Martha became best friends. They loved to play with Barbies and have sleepovers. One day, Margaret and Martha introduced 33-year-old Kathleen 
to their adoptive father, 43-year-old Michael Peterson. Michael was a handsome, charismatic novelist. He was well-traveled, a Vietnam War veteran, and clever. With his devilish grin and charming demeanor, he and Kathleen got on famously. Kathleen probably liked his sharp mind and quick humor. He stood about 5'8 to Kathleen's 5'2, so they looked like the perfect match in photos. I've seen one author describe him as someone with a Napoleon complex, but it's not something I see. I see a natural confidence, much like Kathleen's. He worked out constantly, his fitness remaining a priority as a former Marine. Kathleen also took care of herself, eating right and exercising. So they were one of those couples that just seemed to naturally match. Both of them were fit, attractive, and gregarious. They're always smiling widely in photos and seem to be a very tactile couple, arms around each other or Kathleen sitting on Michael's lap. Their 10-year age difference was barely even noticeable. Michael thought Kathleen was a dynamo, a spitfire. She was smarter than him and didn't let him forget it. Some men might have shied away from a strong woman like Kathleen, but not Michael. He liked how they sparred, matching wits time and again. Kathleen and Michael truly seemed to fit together like two puzzle pieces. Years later, Kathleen's daughter Caitlin would write about her mother meeting Michael in a college essay. Michael Peterson stopped my mother's tears. I used to sit at the top of the stairs, leaning through the banister, and listen to my mother sob every night for a year after my father left. My father had torn her apart, crushing her shell, and the illusion in which she lived, destroying her dignity and pride. But Mike was able to restore her strength and confidence and show her that she could find true love. From the beginning, I was in debt to Mike in my heart and mind for bringing back my mother's happiness. Kathleen and Michael fell deeply in love and they changed each other's lives forever. Michael Ivor Peterson was born on October 23, 1943 to his mother Eleanor and his father Eugene. Michael was from Nashville, Tennessee. In 1961, when he was 18 years old, he moved to Durham so that he could attend college at Duke University. According to Michael, even though he went to Duke, he wasn't a brainiac like his future wife Kathleen. He was a C student and proud of it. Instead of worrying too much about classes, Michael spent time with his friends and joined activities he cared about. By the end of his time at Duke, Michael didn't have good grades, but he still had a lot of accomplishments. He was the president of his fraternity, the managing editor for the college's newspaper, and in the student union. Despite not being a stellar student, he was featured in the who's who among students in American universities and colleges, an odd coincidence that was similar to Kathleen's feature in the high school version of the who's who publication. Not too bad for a C student. In 1965, Michael graduated from Duke with a bachelor's degree in political science. A year later, on July 23, 1966, 22-year-old Michael married his first wife, 23-year-old Patricia Sue Balkman. She went by Patty, and Patty was a traveler. She was born in Arkansas, went to high school in Pennsylvania, college in Texas, and married Michael in Virginia. Around the time of their wedding, Michael became interested in the media coverage of the Vietnam War. Curious, he went to Vietnam to see what was going on for himself. He worked for a U.S. government agency in Ho Chi Minh City, which was called Saigon then. Michael helped research the effects of mechanized infantry and armor in relation to the Vietnam War. The U.S. government was trying to justify sending more tanks, more soldiers, more everything to Vietnam. Later, Michael explained that he believed the research was a facade. The government would send more tanks, more soldiers, and more of everything else no matter what Michael's data proved. After Michael finished his job, he returned to the States. Then, he enlisted in the U.S. military, and on August 24, 1968, Michael returned to Vietnam, this time as a Marine. He served in Vietnam for a few years before retiring from the military. He was honorably discharged after he was injured in a landmine accident. 
His right leg was so badly wounded, he was declared permanently disabled. Or at least, that's what he told everyone. We'll get into that more later. According to Michael, Vietnam provided him with a wealth of new experiences, several military medals, and the inspiration to write his first book. Michael's debut novel was a paperback called The Immortal Dragon. It's about 19th century Vietnam and was pretty successful, selling over 250,000 copies. He later told the Herald Sun, I wanted to write about the war as it really was. War is an awful thing, and I had to show it. Shakespeare had his King Lear. I had my war. Meanwhile, Michael's wife Patty, who had received her bachelor's in English and her master's in education, was a teacher. While Michael was in Vietnam, she taught for the U.S. Department of Defense in Europe. Over the course of her life, Patty Peterson would spend 35 years teaching for the DOD. After Michael returned from Vietnam, he and Patty lived together in the States. But Patty loved Europe and wanted to return. Since Michael had just published his second book on the Vietnam War called A Time of War, they were doing well financially. So Michael and Patty figured it was as good a time as any to go back to Europe. In 1973, they moved to Grafenhausen, Germany. Grafenhausen is located in southwest Germany. It's less than 90 miles from Switzerland and also close to the border of France. While in Germany, Michael and Patty had two sons. First, Clayton Sumner on December 13, 1974, and then Todd Bancroft on March 14, 1976. Still working for the U.S. Department of Defense, Patty taught at an American military base's elementary school. It was there that she met another teacher, Elizabeth Ratliff, who went by Liz. Patty and Liz immediately hit it off. They became good friends. Liz's husband, George Ratliff, was a retired U.S. Air Force captain. Michael, as a retired U.S. Marines captain, bonded with George quickly. For years, the two couples were best friends. They even lived near each other. In the early 80s, Liz and George welcomed two daughters into the world, one right after the other. First, Margaret Elizabeth on December 10, 1981, and then 13 months later, Martha Catalin on January 3, 1983. But shortly after Martha's birth, tragedy struck the Ratliff household. Martha was only six months old when George Ratliff died in a military excursion. According to Michael's 2019 memoir, Behind the Staircase, George was sent to Central America to help the Contras overthrow the Marxist government in Nicaragua. According to Michael, George suffered from an extreme sunburn after a long run. Due to the stress on his body, he had a heart attack and died that night. Ultimately, the details of George's death have not been confirmed. Two years after George died in 1985, Liz passed away too. German medical examiners determined Liz's death was caused by a cerebral hemorrhage. But, as I'm sure you know, we will revisit her death again exhaustively. The important thing to note is that Liz was not Michael's first wife. Many people somehow confuse the story that way. In fact, she wasn't even really Michael's friend. She was more friends with Patty, and Michael was close to George. The couples were close. They had dinners together weekly, vacationed together, and seemed to be each other's family while in Germany. They were close enough that in both of their wills, George and Liz chose Michael Peterson to be legal guardian to their daughters. Now orphans, Margaret and Martha moved in with Michael and Patty's family, just as George and Liz had wanted though Liz's family was unhappy about it. Liz's sister would later say they did come to understand, because George and Liz had lived in Germany so long, that they were closer to the Petersons. They were family, in a way. It might have hurt not to raise her nieces, but it's not like they went to total strangers. But unfortunately, it was around this time in the mid-1980s that Michael and Patty began having marital issues. While we don't know the nuances of their breakup, we do know that Michael cheated on Patty multiple times with both men and women. Later, he would identify as bisexual. Of course, many people say he is gay and was closeted, which would not have been unusual for a man of his generation. And the same goes for being bisexual. But it's important to note that it's obvious Michael loved women. He married twice, 
he had children with his first wife and then fell in love with and married Kathleen. After Kathleen died, he had a decades-long relationship with another woman. He was attracted to women. I think he really is bisexual, but ultimately, it's not anyone else's place to question how he self-identifies. If it was anyone else other than a man accused of murder, we would consider it wrong to question his sexuality. But yes, he did keep his sexuality private. He has always insisted he only had physical relationships with other men, not affairs of the heart. Whatever happened between him and Patty, author Diane Fanning said that taking in Margaret and Martha was also a stressor. She didn't sign up for four kids, is how she put it. I am not certain whether the Ratliffs named Michael and Patty in their wills, or just Michael, but I have always read that it was just Michael. Which kind of makes sense. When George Ratliff made his will, he was close to Michael. By the time Liz changed her will, she depended a lot on Michael. She hired a nanny to take care of her little girl so she could work, but she moved just a few doors down from the Petersons so they could help too. By Michael and Patty's account, he constantly helped Liz around the house and helped pick up and drop off the girls when the nanny wasn't around. It isn't implicitly said, but you get the sense that Patty was a bit of a strange bird. Diane Fanning said that she was an academic. She preferred to work late doing paperwork instead of rushing home to her family. And she was a bit of a dreamer, not really interested in domestic life. She didn't care about cleaning the house or making dinner. Michael took on those responsibilities, and that's just fine. However, it is said that due to her religious upbringing, she only believed in marrying once. She refused to divorce Michael for quite some time, and even when she did, she never remarried, and she remained close to her ex-husband, not just as a co-parent, but as a friend. She would stand by him for the rest of her life. After their separation, Michael moved from Germany to Durham, North Carolina with Margaret and Martha, who were essentially babies. Margaret was about three years old and Martha 18 months old when their mother died, so they were still pretty much toddlers when they moved with Michael. His sons, Clayton and Todd, remained with Patty in Germany through their teen years, which may explain some things about them that I'll get into later. And when Michael moved into his new home in Durham, it just so happened to be right down the street from Kathleen Hunt Atwater. Kathleen's daughter, Caitlin, befriended Michael's daughters, and shortly after, Kathleen and Michael became smitten. From the beginning, Kathleen and Michael knew their relationship was special. For starters, they had so much in common. They were both Duke University alumni and, of course, huge Duke basketball fans. They were both brilliant, witty, and funny, so their flirty banter came easily, and they were both the opposite of their former partners. According to Michael, Kathleen's previous husband was very controlling. In direct contrast, Michael was carefree, and Kathleen was calm, whereas Patty could be harried. It seemed like a match made in heaven. Michael's son Clayton later told documentarians that Michael and Patty's relationship was largely platonic. Clayton hadn't seen his father be romantically in love until he saw Michael interact with Kathleen, his stepmother. He said, Dad and Kathleen just connected on a different plane. By 1989, Kathleen and Michael had merged their families. Instead of living on the same street, Kathleen, her daughter Caitlin, Michael, and his two daughters, Margaret and Martha, were in the same house. When speaking with NBC about the transition, Kathleen's daughter Caitlin explained how excited she was for her two friends, Margaret and Martha, to move in. They all sat me down and said, how would you like it if Martha and Margaret came to live with you? And I immediately thought, a permanent sleepover. Later, Clayton and Todd came from Germany to live with them too. For 14 years, all seven of them lived together. They were a family. For those of you with families of your own, I know what you're thinking. That's two adults and five kids. That's a lot of mouths to feed. That's a lot of sports and piano practices to drive to. And that's a lot of money to spend, and you're right. But Michael and Kathleen could afford their large family, and they were committed to being good parents. They loved their hectic, lively family life. As I mentioned before, 
Kathleen was working her way up the Nortel corporate ladder, and Michael had accepted a $500,000 advance for a book deal. In today's money, that's almost $1.3 million. In 1992, Kathleen and Michael bought a 10,000-square-foot mansion. Michael put down a large deposit, about half of what he had gotten from his book advance. Located on three wooded acres on sprawling land in Durham's Forest Hills neighborhood, this house was gorgeous. The home was older, built in the 1940s. It had a colonial feel, with white siding and square shuttered windows. Outside, it was glorious. Beautiful green foliage and a large outdoor pool with a water fountain in its center. Inside, it was just as grand. Five bedrooms, six bathrooms, a library, a home gym, and a large kitchen and other rooms for entertaining. One of the home's most notable features was a grand spiral staircase leading from the first floor entryway to the second floor. With white trim and dark wood, it was the first thing you noticed when you walked in the front door. But this staircase would not become the most important staircase in the Peterson house. Less noticeable and tucked away near the kitchen was a second staircase, a narrow stairwell that also led to the second floor. The Petersons had paid about 600000 for this house, but today it would be worth 2 and $2.6 million. For Michael and Kathleen's big blended family, this was the perfect house. But as time went on, not everything was perfect for the Petersons. Michael's oldest son from his first marriage, 18-year-old Clayton, was struggling. In the early 90s, Clayton graduated high school in Germany. Then he moved to the U.S. to live with Michael. In the fall, Clayton planned to attend Duke University, like his father. But unlike his father, Clayton was a bit of a loose cannon. And on April 8th of 1993, he was arrested for going 100 miles per hour on Durham City streets while driving drunk. After some finagling in court that summer, Clayton pled guilty to a lesser charge. He paid a $500 fine and was given a six-month suspended sentence, plus one year of unsupervised probation. But soon after, Clayton had a second drunk driving arrest. He had also attempted to flee the police while handcuffed. So instead of attending Duke University that fall, Clayton spent 30 days in rehab treating his alcohol abuse. The next spring, Clayton was able to go to Duke as planned. He studied engineering. But even after multiple run-ins with the law, Clayton hadn't cleaned up his act. In fact, he had done the exact opposite. Before Clayton's year of probation for drunk driving was up, he was in legal trouble again. It was April of 1994, and 19-year-old Clayton Peterson was enjoying college, but not for the academics. He liked to party. As a result, he had run into issues with Duke University's administrators. Duke had instituted a ban on fraternity keg parties. They had also forbidden on-campus bonfires, due to basketball fans being destructive during the NCAA March Madness tournament. Clayton felt these restrictions were ridiculous. They infringed upon his right to party. So on the weekend of April 24th, Clayton took action. First, he wrote a tongue-in-cheek note criticizing the university's policies. One line of the note said, of course you realize that this means war. Then he pried open the basement window of the university's main administrative building crept into the registrar's office, left the note nearby, and lit the fuse to a homemade pipe bomb. Clayton had submerged the gunpowder bomb in a gasoline-filled Gatorade bottle. The bomb could have caused a fiery explosion. Luckily, the fuse didn't work properly and it didn't detonate. But it was a close call. The fuse burned out mere inches away from the bomb. The Herald Sun reported that a Duke University registrar worker found the bomb at noon that Sunday. They noticed scorch marks on the carpet leading to the registrar's office. Following the discovery, university authorities questioned many Duke students, including Clayton. Their investigation led them to search Michael and Kathleen's home, where Clayton lived sometimes. Michael cooperated fully, helpfully showing them around. To his chagrin, the officers discovered Clayton's six additional explosive devices hidden in a closet. According to the Herald Sun, Clayton had made these bombs with bottle rocket fuel from a toy store. A federal agent testified that two of these bombs were rigged to shoot arrows outward as they exploded. 
Officials also uncovered Clayton's materials to make at least 13 more bombs. And when Clayton broke into the university registrar's office, he didn't just plant a bomb. He also stole several items. He took a camera, blank ID cards, a card laminator, and a checkbook. He intended to use these things to create fake IDs for an upcoming vacation. He was going to Myrtle Beach, a place famous for college-age drinking and debauchery. The police found these stolen goods in Clayton's Duke University dorm room. About a week after the break-in, in early May of 1994, law enforcement officials arrested Clayton. He immediately confessed. Duke officials were glad to have caught the perpetrator before graduation that Sunday. If they hadn't, the students, a.k.a. potential suspects, would have left for summer break. According to the Herald Sun, Clayton was charged for three counts related to breaking and entering, as well as possessing an unregistered destructive device. He faced a maximum of 30 years in prison and $750,000 in fines. Initially, he pled not guilty. As the legal proceedings began, Clayton's defense lawyer made the best of a bad situation. After all, his client had already confessed to the crime. But it was sheer luck that Clayton's bomb fuse failed. Someone could have easily been hurt. Still, the attorney claimed that Clayton had purposely made sure the bomb didn't work. According to the lawyer, Clayton wasn't attempting to destroy campus property or hurt anyone. Instead, he was trying to divert attention while he stole the materials to make the fake IDs. Clayton's lawyers told the Herald Sun, obviously Clayton, had absolutely no intention that anyone would be hurt by any of this. Michael told the paper, there was never an intent to ignite the bomb. There was only an apolitical, hedonistic intent to party. Just to clarify, Clayton did ignite the fuse that led to the bomb but I suppose that's beside the point when your son is trying to escape federal prison. Michael did admit that his son's actions were ill-advised. He told the Herald Sun, he's guilty. Even though there was never any intent to hurt either people or property, Clayton never should have done it. What he did was stupid and wrong. Meanwhile, 19-year-old Clayton was in jail. He underwent a 45-day court-ordered psychiatric evaluation which determined he was mentally fit to stand trial. He tried to get psychiatric treatment from Duke, but Duke's legal team refused him. Then Clayton was placed under house arrest in Michael and Kathleen's home. For weeks, Clayton's case made Durham headlines. Michael publicly argued that his son's antics were foolish but excusable. However, federal agents pointed out Clayton's concerning history. While attending high school in Germany, Clayton had blown up a telephone booth with a homemade bomb. He had also stolen chemicals from his school. Then he had tried to ship them to Michael's house in North Carolina. According to the Herald Sun, Clayton's shipped chemicals were intercepted by postal inspectors. Acid had leaked out of the parcel and injured several mail handlers. Maybe if Clayton had faced real repercussions for the German bomb or the dangerous chemicals he shipped, he never would have tried it again at Duke, but after getting away with it, he seemed to escalate. And Michael did seem to make a lot of excuses for his son. You have to wonder if he felt guilty about the time he lost as a father to his boys when he moved back to the U.S. and his son stayed with Patty, who, admittedly, wasn't a strong parent. Clayton Peterson seemed to be a very troubled young man, a dangerous young man, and he was about to seriously pay for it. Taking into account Clayton's concerning history and his numerous DIY explosives, things were not looking good for him. So he switched his plea from not guilty to guilty, avoiding trial. On December 29, 1994, now 20-year-old Clayton Peterson was sentenced to four years and one month in prison. At the sentencing hearing, Clayton apologized for his actions. Four years later, he was released from prison. And in prison, he seemed to have cleaned up his act. He went on to be valedictorian at North Carolina State University. Then, he studied engineering in graduate school. Clayton's illegal antics undoubtedly put Michael and Kathleen's family through the ringer. Maybe going through this time together as a united front brought them even closer. Because Michael and Kathleen's relationship was still doing well, really well. Friends and family said the couple was strong. 
They traveled together frequently, going to places like London, Paris, Florence, Athens, Venice, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Hanoi. Martha, their youngest daughter, explained to documentarians that her parents didn't have any problems. She said Michael and Kathleen's relationship was wonderful, beautiful, and joyful. In an interview for the documentary The Staircase, Martha said that even when the couple did fight, it was lighthearted. For example, Michael would always come home late from the gym, which frustrated Kathleen. Dinner was ready and Michael was late, again. But no one ever lost their temper. The situation just became a running joke. And in October of 1996, Michael finally officially divorced his first wife, Patty. Then he proposed to Kathleen on that New Year's Eve. Kathleen's sister, Candace, described Kathleen as glowing on her wedding day. The following June, she and Michael were married at home, with Kathleen gliding down the beautiful grand staircase, decorated with flowers. Her daughters were all bridesmaids. Kathleen would describe it as one of the happiest days of her life. The photos of the event are so lovely, with Kathleen and Michael gazing adoringly at each other, and the giggling preteen bridesmaids were bursting with happiness as they posed together. It was a permanent sleepover for the close-knit sisters. Near this time, Michael began writing regularly for the local Durham newspaper, The Herald Sun. He had written a few things for the paper in the past. In February of 1996, he wrote a piece criticizing the Durham education system for failing its black students. And sometimes, Michael was even the subject of the Herald Sun articles. In June of 1996, journalist Blake Dickinson wrote a feature on Michael. It outlined that, despite being a successful author, most of Michael's local fame came primarily from his son Clayton. The bomb attempt was more newsworthy than Michael's novels. This is quite a petty piece of journalism, even if it was true. Sounds like a writer didn't like Michael poaching his territory at the paper. And Michael seemed to hit back by writing even more guest columns. Then in 1997, Michael began a regular twice-a-week column on Durham's current events. No one was surprised. It was a natural progression. In Michael's column, he wrote about a wide range of hot-button topics, but he spent most of his time advocating against racism. He wrote about Durham's white supremacy, historical lynching, prejudiced public officials, and more. Hard subjects for North Carolina, a former slave state. To this day, it has over 40 Confederate monuments. Durham citizens had strong feelings about Michael's writing, and he leaned into that. He used fictional characters and satirical humor to drive his controversial points home. He would guest star on local radio shows to hear what his readers thought. He held a seminar called The Ethics of Outspoken Journalism, and the Herald Sun managing editor deemed Michael's column outrageous and irreverent. Overall, Michael's writing was polarizing. His readers either loved him or loved to hate him. And perhaps most notably, Michael's column regularly criticized the Durham legal system, especially the police department. Michael wrote about how they seemed to target black people, how they let politicians get away with illegal activity, how Durham had the highest crime rate in North Carolina. Michael often sarcastically awarded well-known Durham figures stupid prizes. On numerous occasions, he called out the police for these stupid prizes. He accused the cops of being rotten and covering up crime. Unsurprisingly, the Durham Police Department did not appreciate the constant criticism. In Michael's memoir, Behind the Staircase, he said that the chief of police emailed him that the column hurt police morale. But Michael wasn't worried about the police department's morale. He wanted justice. The last trial for him happened around 1998. A Durham dentist had called the police. He had seen a drug deal happen at the house next door to his practice. But this house wasn't just any house. It was the city mayor's house. Soon after the dentist called the authorities, a local gang burned down his dental practice. Michael thought that the dentist's police report and the subsequent arson were related. Michael suspected it was all a result of city corruption as if the mayor had a drug habit and wanted the dentist kept quiet. So in August of 1999, Michael took matters into his own hands. 
He resigned from his columnist position with the Herald Sun and ran for city mayor himself. Was there actual corruption in Durham's politics and police department in the late 90s? It's unclear, but that's certainly what Michael thought. He ran alongside four other mayoral candidates, most of whom were vastly more qualified than him. There was the incumbent mayor, Nick Tennyson, an attorney, a Durham City Council member, and one other man who, like Michael, was running for mayor with little to no political or legal expertise. Michael's campaign centered on his desire to reform Durham city government and the police department. He wanted to improve crime, race relations, and the economy, which honestly is an admirable campaign to run on. In the Herald Sun's profile of mayoral candidates, Michael identified as in-between conservative and liberal views. He listed his hobbies as swimming, weightlifting, and reading. His hero was FDR, and his favorite book was To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. He left the prompt, self-written description of political philosophy part blank. When asked, why are you qualified to hold this office, Michael responded, For two years, I have written almost exclusively about Durham. I think I have a better understanding of this city, its problems, and potential than anyone else. I should be elected because I have brought forward problems and concerns no one else has dared to raise, and I have the ability to correct and solve those problems. But in September of 1999, Michael's credibility was tainted, and he would lose the mayoral election partly because of it. To explain this fully, we'll have to go back a few years. Remember that Vietnam leg injury? Almost 10 years before Michael ran for mayor, it was March of 1990. Ed Hodges, a columnist for the Herald Sun, wrote a piece on Michael. Michael was, after all, a minor celebrity. He was known as a Vietnam veteran and a successful novelist. Reporter Hodges' angle was simple. Michael's fatal injury in the Vietnam War inspired him to write his books. In an 800-word article, Michael regaled Hodges with specific details about how a landmine exploded near him. His right leg was badly wounded. Another officer died. Michael told him, You never believe you're the one who's going to be killed. You think it's going to be a buddy, someone else, not you. Michael had a long hospital stay in Vietnam, recovered fully, and was honorably discharged from the U.S. military with a permanent disability. He returned from Vietnam well-decorated with a silver star, a bronze star, and two purple hearts. Fast forward three years. It was November of 1993. Michael and Kathleen visited Vietnam. This was the first time Michael had returned to Vietnam since he served as a Marine in the Vietnam War. When he returned to the U.S., Michael wrote a five-part series chronicling his trip for the Herald Sun. Throughout the series, Michael compared his past experiences in Vietnam to his current, from American soldier to American tourist. The articles were well-written, haunting, and insightful. In the first of five articles, Michael described how he watched coffins of U.S. soldiers get forklifted off an airplane while he was awaiting his own flight from California to Vietnam. By chance, Michael spotted the coffin of a Marine he knew. Ronald. Michael wrote, He was a poster Marine, a perfect physical specimen. We double dated. He was a great guy. He lasted two weeks in Vietnam before taking a bullet to the brain. It was a poignant way to demonstrate the nerves a young man must feel as he heads to war. Again, he mentions his many military medals, including the two Purple Hearts. But Michael's five part series wasn't perfect. Sometimes he wrote with casual racism. He called Vietnamese women promiscuous and poked fun at a singer's accented English. It was unusual for a man so concerned with Durham's race relations. But it also sort of reads as something a man of his generation would consider harmless. He wasn't using racist slurs and would probably be surprised to know that people thought his writing was racist. I also noticed it in his memoirs from his time in prison. It definitely sometimes reads, as something an old man would say, out of touch with our evolving understanding of underlying prejudices. And yet, he would probably staunchly deny being racist. It's complicated for men of his age, even when they are well-meaning. Still, 
This series in the Herald Sun helped Michael nab his job as a bi-weekly columnist years later. Plus, it was great publicity for his new book, which was published the same year as the series. It, like his other books, was about the Vietnam War. All of this is to say, in Durham, North Carolina, Michael was known for his status as a decorated Vietnam veteran. It was his identity. It's what he talked about. It's what he wrote his novels about. And it was part of his appeal as a potential mayor. So when the Herald Sun published an article in September of 1999 entitled, Durham Mayoral Candidate Michael Peterson Fabricated War Injury Admits Falsehood, it changed everything. Someone had uncovered Michael's military records. As it turns out, he hadn't narrowly escaped death while standing near a Vietnamese landmine in 1971. In fact, he hadn't been in Vietnam in 1971. He left two years earlier on September 4, 1969. Then, he went to San Diego. In June of 1970, he was deployed to Atsugi, Japan. There, he provided security as a military police officer for a naval air station. While in Japan, Michael did have a leg injury, but it was from a car crash. Another car hit Michael's vehicle head-on at a railroad crossing. Some facets of Michael's original story were true. The officer Michael was with did die, and Michael suffered severe injuries, including rib fractures, a punctured lung, and a badly wounded right leg. As he said, he was honorably discharged and considered permanently disabled. Still, Michael knew what he did was wrong. He told the Herald Sun, It's a cover. I admit it. My second wife, she doesn't know. I'm going to discuss it with her today. In addition to the false landmine story, Michael's military record also did not indicate that he had received two Purple Hearts. Michael couldn't provide the written certifications that come with the medals. However, Michael maintained that he did receive them. He explained that he had had two minor wounds caused by shrapnel, and Michael did possess a medal that he said represented two Purple Hearts. But at the end of the day, Michael had lied. His military career was already fine, even if his red badge of courage was a little unexciting. Durham residents were baffled by Michael's deceit. Why did he needlessly embellish? Michael's mayoral campaign was entrenched in demanding honesty from public officials. Yet here he was, lying for seemingly no reason at all, except, probably, to sell more of his Vietnam War-related novels. It's possible he was not really considering being a politician who would have to defend his war record when he chose to embellish as an author. But, if he would lie about that, what else would he lie about? In October of 1999, Michael lost in the primary elections. His mayoral candidacy was over. Incumbent Mayor Nick Tennyson was re-elected that November. This was a tough time for Michael, Kathleen, and their family. Their reputation was more damaged than it was a few months ago. And, for the first time ever, money was a little tight for the Petersons. Since Michael quit his position at the Herald Sun, he didn't really have a regular income. But he did, however, have a military pension due to his disability, which was $45,000 a year. That would be about $75,000 today, which is not insignificant. I've often read or heard in documentaries and other podcasts that Michael had no income, that he did not work and just lived off Kathleen. That's not true. But, in comparison, Kathleen was the main breadwinner. After her promotion at Nortel in 1999, she made a reasonably high salary, and unlike her husband, the writer, who puttered around the house and went to the gym daily, Kathleen worked grueling hours at Nortel. She was always on the clock, even at home, often bringing homework and taking calls at night and on weekends. And beyond their extravagant lifestyle, they had five children, three of whom still needed college tuition money. Caitlin was at Cornell, an Ivy League school, and Margaret was at Tulane, a prestigious private school in New Orleans, and Martha began Naropa University in San Francisco the fall before Kathleen's death, another expensive out-of-state school. 
Clayton and Todd had both already graduated from North Carolina University and were out of the house, but they were still financially dependent on their parents, Patty included. Clayton was going for his master's degree. Michael and Patty had even thrown an empty nest party when Martha went off to college in September of 2001. During that party, everyone drunkenly wound up in the swimming pool, and Kathleen dove into the shallow end, scaring everyone to death when Michael had to pull her out of the pool. She had a neck injury from the incident, for which she was still taking Valium and Flexeril, a muscle relaxant, when she died that following December. According to an article from All That's Interesting, Kathleen and Michael had a few tense moments over money, especially after Michael lost the election. But it's likely that these weren't shouting matches. That wasn't Michael's style. His son Todd told interviewers for The Staircase that Michael was far more likely to chuckle and walk off than engage in an argument. He just didn't have that temper. Todd said that as kids, Michael never hit him or his siblings. He might have spanked them for disciplinary reasons, but as the kids got older, Michael stopped. For all intents and purposes, Michael and Kathleen's relationship seemed fine. The Peterson family was fine. Everyone was safe and healthy. That's all that mattered. And the rest would figure itself out. And in a way, it almost did. On Friday, December 7, 2001, David Perlmutt had some good news. David and Michael were co-authors. Three years before, they had written a book about U.S. Marines called Charlie Two Shoes and the Marines of Love Company. David had recently spoken with Stratton Leopold, a Hollywood producer. For a while, Stratton had hinted that he was thinking about optioning Charlie Two Shoes. In the film industry, that's when the author gives someone the rights to make their book into a movie. It's no guarantee that you'll get a film, but it is a very good sign. And just that day, Stratton had pulled the trigger. He told David the option was 100% certain. Elated, David went to call the Peterson household so he could tell Michael that their book might become a movie. At about 6 p.m., Kathleen answered David's call. They spoke for a while, and David later reported that everything seemed normal. After about 10 minutes, David asked, Is the old man there? Referring to Michael. A common joke for many friends and family due to Mike and Kathleen's age difference. Kathleen teased that Michael was there, but he would have to do some chores before he could talk to David. Empty the dryer, mop the kitchen floor. David said he could hear Michael laughing in the background. This was normal for Kathleen and Michael. They were known for their playful teasing. At last, Michael got on the phone and heard the good news from David. His financial struggles were over. A movie was in the works. Later that evening, later that evening, Michael and Kathleen went to a Christmas party to celebrate. They danced the night away before returning home at about 1 a.m. On Saturday, December 8, 2001, Michael and Kathleen spent the day bringing Christmas decorations out of storage. This was their annual tradition. According to Michael, they went all out. They had 48 candles for their 48 windows, 36 nutcrackers for each step in the hallway, two large wooden reindeer lawn ornaments adorned with red bows on their necks, and an uncountable number of Christmas lights, and many, many ornaments for their 12-foot Christmas tree. The plan was to set up all the decorations the next day. That evening, Michael rented the movie America's Sweethearts from Blockbuster. Around 10 p.m., Michael and Kathleen watched it while drinking wine. Todd stopped by to leave his car at the house. He was going to a Christmas party in the neighborhood, but was riding with a friend because he would be drinking. Todd said his father and Kathleen looked like they were in good spirits as they waved goodbye when he left for the party. At 11.08 p.m., toward the end of the movie, Kathleen's co-worker Helen called. Helen and Kathleen made plans for an 8 a.m. conference call the next morning, on Sunday. Helen told Kathleen that she would send a follow-up email, and she did, at 11.53 p.m. But Kathleen never opened the email. According to Michael, at midnight, he and Kathleen went outside and sat by the pool. He described the night as magical. It was an unseasonably warm December night, about 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or over 12 degrees Celsius. Many people, especially those who don't live in the South, have doubted the story. They think it was too cold, 
particularly for Michael, who was wearing shorts, but Kathleen was also wearing flip-flops. But as many Southerners will tell you, this is nice weather. My husband will wear shorts until it gets into the 30s here. And what's more, they were smoking. Most people know Michael smoked a pipe from the Staircase documentary, but they don't know that Kathleen was a casual cigarette smoker. And while Mike puffed his pipe constantly, he didn't smoke cigars in the house, and Kathleen wouldn't have smoked inside either. Kathleen did not smoke during the day, or even every day, but she did enjoy a couple of cigarettes with wine after dinner sometimes. She and Michael both were wine connoisseurs and drank it with dinner most nights, sometimes switching to champagne later. So they would grab a bottle of wine or champagne, a couple of glasses, a cigar for Michael and cigarettes for Kathleen, and head down to their pool. And the pool really was a showcase. You got to it from a winding footpath from the house, and it was surrounded by beautiful foliage even in the winter, and it was kept open year-round with a fountain going. The Petersons were known to sit by their pool and gaze at the stars as they finished their drinks and smoked. That night, Michael said they were drinking champagne, celebrating his movie option, and talking about the future. He puffed on his cigar as Kathleen smoked her cigarettes. Their two English bulldogs lay at their feet. A little before two o'clock in the morning, Michael said that Kathleen left the pool and went to bed. She had to get to sleep since she had that conference call the next morning. Michael told his wife goodnight and said that he would be up in a bit. He was still finishing his cigar. 30 minutes later, at 2.30 a.m., Michael left the pool and went inside. At 2.40 a.m., Michael called 911. The dispatcher later said that Michael was hysterical. I won't read you the transcript of the call or play it. I'm sure many of you have heard it enough times to recite it yourself. If not, it's very easy to find online. But I will tell you about some portions. Michael did seem out of breath, possibly hysterical. The first thing he says is 1810 Cedar Street, please. He said his wife has had an accident, but she was still breathing. He begged for help, as the dispatcher calmly asked the necessary questions. He shouts, she fell down the stairs, please come. Like many people who call 911, Michael sounds impatient with the questions. When she asks him how many stairs, she meant how many did his wife fall down, but Michael seems to think she's asking how many stairs were on the staircase in total. He says, huh? Then what? Sounding aggravated, and then says, oh, 1520, I don't know. I've seen many true crime people grasp at this part, saying he sounds flustered, like it wasn't part of the script he had planned when he called 911. To me, he sounds confused as to why this woman wanted to know how many stairs they had. I think this is a misunderstanding, and one I've heard on plenty of other documentaries and podcasts, those that think he's guilty and those that think he's innocent. I'm not calling anyone out, I just don't think it's that important. I think it really does sound like a misunderstanding. In general, it's hard to judge 911 calls, especially for lay people. We often feel that the dispatcher isn't being sympathetic enough, or that the caller sounds suspicious. It is always a subjective experience listening to these calls. What's important to me is that Michael clearly gives his address right away, something that even innocent people forget to do. He also says it's in Forest Hills, giving the subdivision. The only thing I did find odd about Michael's 911 call is he never mentions all the blood. I'm sure you have also seen the crime scene photos of Kathleen Peterson at the bottom of the stairs. If not, that's also a quick Google. But I warn you, it is very gruesome. It's one of the bloodiest crime scenes I've ever seen. So to me, that is strange. You would think that in all his hysteria, he would say, my God, there's so much blood. But again, 911 calls are subjective. To be fair to him, he called, He gave the address right away, and while some think it's strange that he hung up twice, it's not that strange to me. If it was my husband dying before my eyes, I would make sure 911 knew the emergency and my address, and then I would want to do all I could to help him. I would want to hold him, not sit on the phone with 911 answering questions. And something that is rarely mentioned is that Michael ran to get towels to put under Kathleen's head. It seems he was trying to help her, 
His instinct was either to staunch the bleeding or cushion her head without moving her body. Many people are trained not to move someone after a fall in case they have a neck injury. Considering Michael's training as a Marine, this makes sense. He would later say he wiped blood from her face as he was putting towels under her head. But he did not attempt CPR, which, considering his Marine training, you can see is strange. You can read this scene in all sorts of ways, which is a harbinger to come for this entire case. It's all about perception. And six minutes later, when an ambulance still hadn't shown up, he calls 911 back, even more distressed, now shouting that she's not breathing, and please, would you hurry up? And then he hung up again. But he doesn't ask about mouth-to-mouth, nor does he indicate that he's trying it. Many people have a problem with that. That's understandable. But he would also later say that he knew she was dying. He had seen men die in war, and he knew what it looked like as the light left their eyes. Less than 10 minutes after Michael's first call, two paramedics arrive on the scene. They reported that the front door to the Petersons' home was open. They noticed it had smeared blood on it, along with a couple blood droplets in the walkway. Straight ahead through the front door was the main staircase that led to the second floor. To the left, down a hallway, was the enclosed staircase, which also led to the second floor. This staircase did not have a spiral. It went parallel to the hallway, so at the very bottom of the steps, there was a sharp turn. This allowed the staircase to open into the hallway. That's where paramedics found Kathleen. She was lying at the bottom of the stairwell. Her legs were out in the hallway, with her torso on the landing of the stairs and her head toward the steps. And like I said, there were towels under her head. Shoes, socks, and paper towels were also near her body, as if Michael had grabbed anything and everything to help soak up the blood. Because there was a lot of blood, Kathleen's white pants and blue top were covered in it. In the stairwell, there was even more, on the floor, the walls, and the steps. As I said, the amount of blood was staggering. The emergency responders said Michael had a dazed stare and was audibly sobbing. He was obviously very, very upset, they said. His tennis shoes and clothes were covered in Kathleen's blood. Paramedics could not find Kathleen's heartbeat. 48-year-old Kathleen Hunt Atwater Peterson was dead. It appeared to be an accident that she had fallen down the stairs. But the first responders were shocked by the amount of blood present, and some of them thought the blood was dry. As if Kathleen had lain in that stairwell, not for 30 minutes, but for hours. Suspicious, they called homicide detectives to the scene, and the detectives immediately treated this as a criminal investigation. However, it's important to note that not one of the policemen nor the detectives noted in their reports that they thought the blood was dry, even though the detectives were definitely not on the scene within minutes. Even the uniform police trailed the paramedics by a few minutes. That detail about dried blood might not seem like that big a deal, but it would be a big deal at trial. It would call into question just how long Kathleen had lain there. It would call into question Michael's version of events. Was she really breathing when he found her? Law enforcement was allowed to testify to the dried blood, even though they neglected to put it in their reports. That is an extremely important detail for a police report. And I want to mention one other thing. It is entirely possible that Michael was mistaken when he said Kathleen was still breathing. There are many reasons he could have thought she was. If he was moving her head to place towels, her mouth may have moved, and air or gas left in her body may have been expelled. Or it may have simply just been wishful thinking. And you know what? Maybe she was still breathing when he called. Maybe it was a death rattle, the final gasps. It is very common when someone dies. We don't have actual proof that the blood was dry. No photographs actually show that. No reports in the crime scene. And we can talk about the possibility of how long she lived later with the autopsy. The photos taken are after she died and after her body is moved and you still can't exactly tell what, if any of the blood is dry, just by looking at these photos. 
But still, even when her body is eventually moved, there is so much blood pooling it splashes around more, according to some witnesses. Making matters worse, shortly after the paramedics arrived, a parade of people entered the home, a fire engine crew, then police officers. Michael's son, Todd, arrived home from the party. Next, a friend of Todd's who is a med student. Then neighbors, friends, the medical examiner, crime scene technicians, a photographer, and more. There were conflicting accounts of the crime scene, amateur investigation tactics, misleading clues, and skewed motivations. The crime scene was not secured for more than an hour. The police would later defensively say they weren't used to securing a crime scene that big. 10,000 square feet is not your average house. But it's not like the whole family was there. Most of the people there were their people. And they could have called in more officers if that's what they needed to secure the scene. It's a weak excuse for what would be a shitty crime scene investigation. From the start, police did not believe Michael's version of events. Over the course of the next week, investigators found incriminating material on Michael's computer. It was a lot of gay porn and also conversations about meeting up with escorts. The police and prosecutors would lean heavily on this as evidence. The police also discovered Kathleen's $1.8 million life insurance policy. Michael was named the beneficiary. And the officers were hesitant to support Michael, the outspoken journalist who wrote disparaging articles about the Durham Police Department for two long years. Eleven days after Kathleen's death, on December 20th, 58-year-old Michael Ivor Peterson was indicted for his wife's murder. He surrendered himself to the police and was taken into custody. To news reporters, Michael said, Kathleen was my life. I've whispered her name in my heart a thousand times. She is there, and I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her. He spent the holidays in jail, and his pitiful children spent that horrific holiday alone in that big house by themselves. Wearing brave faces as they put up the Christmas decorations and decorated the tree that their parents never got to. Pulling together a Christmas dinner. Opening the presents their mother had thoughtfully chosen for them. It's truly heartbreaking to think about it. Caitlin had lost her real mother, though thankfully her father would rush to her side. Todd and Clayton had lost a loving stepmother. But they also had Patty rush to be with them. And Margaret and Martha were devastated. They called Kathleen mom. She was the first woman in their lives who had combed their hair, bought them pretty dresses. They didn't remember their own mother at all and only had faint memories of Patty. Kathleen and Michael were their world. And now she was gone. And he sat in jail awaiting his bond hearing. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank and me, and of course, all editorial opinions are my own. Join me for part two of Kathleen Peterson's case next week as we analyze the crime scene in detail, outline the police investigation, explore Michael's potential motives, court experiences, and more. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.